this is part two of our neuroanatomy lecture covering the higher order centers of the nervous system. By higher order centers, I'm referring to three structures, the brain, the cerebellum, which is located just below the occipital lobe of the brain, as well as the brainstem. This is in contrast to the lower order centers, which are comprised of the spinal cord and neural tracts that are composed of neurons. So we'll be looking at the higher order centers in this section of the lecture. So one thing that I wanted to go over before we start looking at each of these higher order centers is just a general layout of the brain. The brain is or can be divided into four different lobes or four different areas. The frontal lobe is the area located in the front of your head, uh, whereas the temporal lobe is near the ear area. Parietal lobe is towards the top back of your head and the occipital lobe is located in the rear. The way that we distinguish between these different lobes has to do with landmarks that are located on the surface of the cerebrum, which is what we're essentially looking at right now. We have uh, landmarks that are called a sulcus, or sulci, that's plural, um, which is referring to the groove or furrows, these folds that we see on the surface of the brain. Um, in between those grooves, or in between the sulci, we have a gyrus, which is the ridge that's created as a result of those grooves. So we have one landmark called the central sulcus that is distinguishing between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. We also have something called the sylvian fissure, um, which is another groove that distinguishes the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe and the parietal lobes. So the first part of the higher order centers is the brain. Um, there are multiple structures that we'll be talking about, but again, these all have to do with voluntary movement. There's many structures we will not be covering because they are not directly involved with those functions. So the first thing we'll be looking at is the cerebrum, which is basically what we just looked at in the previous slide, but now we have a somewhat different um, viewpoint, not from the perspective of different lobes, but looking at the um, what's called somatotopic organization, meaning that certain areas, superficial areas of the brain, specifically superficial areas of the cerebral cortex, or the surface of the cerebrum are dedicated to controlling certain things or they have very specific functions. So the first part of the cerebral cortex that we'll address is something called the sensory cortex. The sensory cortex is located posterior to the central sulcus. So one could refer to it as the postcentral gyrus, which would just mean the postcentral ridge, for example. So this is the area that includes several specific regions that receive sensory information. That sensory information, information is transmitted via sensory nerves that receive specific types of information. There's sensory nerves for pain, for temperature, for pressure, um, for smell, for sight, for hearing. There's many different types of sensory structures and that information gets transmitted to the sensory cortex. We also have a primary motor cortex, which is located anterior to the central sulcus on the precentral gyrus. The primary motor cortex is really the main area for voluntary movement. Whenever you conceive of some plan to move, this is where it's generated. This is where the neural impulses are generated um, that eventually gets sent to the innervated muscle fibers to create the movement that you want to do.
Another area that is just anterior to the primary cortex, primary motor cortex, I should say, is the premotor cortex. Premotor is simply referring to its location, generally speaking. Um, it also, in a sense, relates to its function because it is involved in organizing movements before they are initiated. So there is a role in terms of planning movement that the premotor cortex is involved with. Another area is a supplementary motor area. Just realize that it should be supplementary motor, not premotor there. Um, so just make a note of that. The supplementary motor area, this is located on the medial surface of the frontal lobe adjacent to the portions of the primary cortex. So this area is involved with sequential movements as well as preparing and organizing movement. So one interesting thing that I mentioned is something called somatotopic organization. In other words, certain areas of the cerebral cortex are linked to controlling various areas of the body. And in the outline that's also posted um, for this topic, you'll see an image called motor homunculus. This is the motor cortex representation of the muscles of the body. And essentially what this is showing us is the proportion of the motor cortex that's dedicated to certain areas of the body. So the hands are very large, indicating there's a large proportion of the motor cortex dedicated to innervating and controlling the hands. The lips and tongue are also enlarged on this motor homunculus because it's showing the proportion of the motor cortex that is dedicated to controlling the muscles of the lips and the tongue. So um, that's an interesting way to describe or depict how much of the motor cortex is dedicated to certain areas of the body or controlling certain areas of the body. Another area of the cerebrum is the basal ganglia. Uh, the basal ganglia is considered to be subcortical, so it's below the cortex, the cerebral cortex, and it is a collection of nuclei. Now, there's two different terms, or two different ways, I should say, to describe the term nuclei. Uh, generally speaking, from biology, nuclei is referring to multiple nucleuses, uh, multiple cell nucleuses. But in this case, nuclei is referring to collection of nerve cells. So when you see the term nuclei in reference to the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system, that's what this is referring to, a collection of nerve cells. Specifically with the basal ganglia though, there are uh, three different collections. There's the caudate nucleus, there's a putamen, and the globus pallidus. These are buried within the cerebral hemispheres, but they do receive information from the cerebral cortex and the brainstem, as well as sending information to the brainstem. And some functions that the basal ganglia performs are things like planning and initiating movement. So there's more than one structure that may have a similar role. They also function to control agonist muscles during movement. Three other structural components of the brain that also function to control voluntary movement are the diencephalon, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. The diencephalon is the area in the image that is basically right in the center. Um, you can see that it's composed of two things, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. What's interesting about the thalamus in particular is that is, it is considered to be a sensory relay station in that it receives and integrates sensory information from the spinal cord and the brainstem. Plus, it also sends information to the cerebral cortex. It's a very, very important structure in terms of uh, sending out and receiving sensory information. Then we also have the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is really important in terms of uh, hormonal regulation. The cerebellum, as we saw in a previous slide, located just below the occipital lobe, sometimes it's referred to as the little brain um, because it 
kind of looks very similar to the Cerebrum itself. It has two hemispheres. It has this kind of folding appearance with the, um, the sulci and the gyri. Um, but its function is very different from what is going on with the Cerebrum. We have our you know, main sensory and motor areas in the cerebral cortex. Uh, for the cerebellum, it's slightly different. Um, when we move, we want to perform smooth, coordinated movements, accurate movements. But if we have injury occurring to the cerebellum, this now turns into clumsy movement. So when we ever have dysfunction here, that is the result. Um, we also know that the cerebellum acts as a type of movement error detection or correction system. It's very interesting. When we want to perform a movement, we send neural impulses or electrical signals via motor neurons to the innervated muscle fibers that would create the movement. Well, a copy of that information is also sent to the cerebellum. This is referred to as an efferent copy. So the cerebellum gets an efferent copy of the movement that we want to do before the movement actually has been, um, has actually taken place. And then the last structure of the brain involved with voluntary movement is the brainstem. The brainstem is specifically composed of the midbrain pons and medulla. However, I listed pons, medulla, and reticular formation because the reticular formation is located in the brainstem, um, but it's these three structures that are related to movement and not so much the midbrain itself. So this area is directly connected to the spinal cord. And the pons is involved in various body functions, things like chewing, and the medulla is more of a regulatory center for physiological processes, things like breathing. Um, however, the reticular formation is somewhat different in that it is an interc interconnected set of nuclei and it integrates sensory and motor information. Some areas of the reticular formation serve to inhibit neural signals traveling to skeletal muscle, while other zones or other areas serve to activate neural signals to those skeletal muscles. So we see some difference in terms of the function um, compared to other areas.